Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. Stay with us now, for it is evening. Let your light scatter the darkness. God be with you all. Let us sing our thanks to God. Blessed are you.
I invite you to stand in a, off, as a reading from the Gospel of Luke. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Then he withdrew from them, about a stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not by will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief, and he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. While he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? When those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police, and elders who had come for him, Have you come out with swords and clubs, as if I were a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. So during the weeks of Lent, uh, we're going to dig deeper into the Gospels and what each of the four Gospels say about the cross. Uh, a couple Sundays ago, I uh, spoke about what the book of Mark, because we're in the year of Mark, um, what it emphasized about the Gospel, about the cross. And now we're going to hear in chronological order... Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You already heard Mark, so I guess we're a little out of order, but tonight we're going to talk about Matthew. And as I said on that Sunday, these Gospels were written to emphasize the meaning of Jesus' life and written for particular communities of faith. And those communities had particular circumstances and concerns and setbacks going on in their lives. And... So, today we're going to dig deeper into how uh, Luke looks at the cross. Luke was a physician. He wrote the gospel about 10 or so years after Mark. He followed much of Mark's outline, but introduced some new elements as well. We know Luke was a doctor from Paul's uh, warm comments that he makes in Colossians 4.14. 4, Luke, the beloved physician, he writes. Luke is listed separately from the Jews in chapter 4 of Colossians, which leads us to believe that he was a Gentile, which would make him the only Gentile writer in the Bible. Paul and Luke worked and traveled side by side for the first journeys right up to Paul's final hours. Luke remained a true friend. Paul wrote, only Luke is with me. And he wrote this to Timothy from his death cell in 2 Timothy 4.11. Luke was a lover of people. He was a healer of the soul. He states in Luke 1.4 his reason for writing his gospel so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Luke's gospel is addressed to Theophilus, who may be a wealthy benefactor or just the general audience, because Theophilus meant friends of God, so it's hard to know. Luke calls the Garden of Gethsemane the Mount of Olives. 
because Luke is writing to a mostly Gentile community. Gentile Christians were people who weren't originally Jewish. Luke uses a better known or familiar general term. So, um, so he says Garden of Gethsemane because local Jewish community would have called it uh, Gethsemane. Sorry, he calls it Mount of Olives because the local community would have called it Gethsemane, but he knows the, the general term around the area was Mount of Olives. So Luke, like Mark, presents a very human Jesus struggling with his future, what God wants him to do. And Mark, the disciples fall asleep three times, but in Luke, they only fall asleep once and then are given an excuse that they were sleepy due to being stressed out, basically. In fact, Luke is much more sympathetic toward the disciples than Mark is. In Mark, Mark is letting us know that anyone, anyone can receive God's grace, forgiveness, and love, even complete failures and deserters. Luke's trying to say something a little different. For Luke, the disciples were pretty decent people who were trying to be faithful. And Luke's gospel is only half of a larger work. So this is only part one of a two-part uh, series. Luke is also the writer of the book of the Acts of the Apostles, or the book of Acts. And that tells the story of the early church. So Luke tells the story of what happens when Jesus ascended from heaven after the resurrection all the way through to the near end of the Apostle Paul's ministry. And I think Luke figured that it would be more believable in the second half of his writings if his disciples uh, were a bit more heroic. <laughs> um, in the book of the Acts, they are the leaders of this new church. And uh, so if their actions in the Gospel of Luke were a bit more together, it would be more plausible to believe that they would start this great mission. So, for example, there's the scene of the Last Supper, and Jesus doesn't warn the disciples of failing, falling away like in Mark. Instead, he promises that even though they will be tested, they won't ultimately fail. There's another key scene in Luke, and it's the healing of the slave's ear. The Gospel of Luke is a gospel of compassion. When you're seeking to hear a compassionate ear or a compassionate motivation, the Gospel of Luke is your book. Jesus is a compassionate healer. In his very first sermon, Jesus announced that he's come to bring good news to the poor, proclaim release from the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set the oppressed free, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus begins a new age of history of God's relationship with the world. In the first age, God identified and elected Israel to be the chosen people. And in the second age, Jesus embodies God's love and compassion and mercy for the world in his personhood. The new age has signs of healings and miracles and the declaration of God's intent to save all people. And in the third age, there's three. Jesus ascends to heaven and empowers the disciples then and now to care for this world with healing and reconciliation, to live out what he embodied. We're living in the third age. So all through Luke, there is this message that we're called to do things Jesus came to do, that we're called to follow these footsteps to care for the poor, to release those who are captive, to tend the needs of all people, to announce God's favor. And one way Luke exemplifies this message of reconciliation is the scene in which the sworn political enemies of Pilate and Herod become friends and co-collaborators in 2312. And it's also in his crucifixion. So like Mark, we see the horror of the cross 
And while Mark only describes Jesus as crying out in despair, Luke tells us three things that Jesus says. First, Jesus forgives the crowd. Second, Jesus promises the criminal that he'll join Jesus in paradise. And third, Jesus trusts God right up to the end, whereas Mark ends in utter despair. The disciples don't completely abandon him. They stood at a distance and they watched. The centurion declares that Jesus is innocent, giving a shout out to the Gentile community that's listening, that even at the cross, their kind saw who Jesus was also. And Luke's resurrection story, it's similar to Mark's, except that the women do come back and they do tell the disciples what happened, and the disciples don't believe it. Luke emphasizes disbelief before belief. Luke wants to tell us that doubt and faith are woven together, that they're much closer than we might imagine. In the Bible, faith doesn't imply that you don't have doubt, rather that you hang in there, that you keep trusting God, even though you do have doubt. In Luke 24, we hear the story of what happened after Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of Easter. Two disciples are walking home, totally stunned by what's happened, and Jesus joins them on the road, but they don't recognize him. And so he starts to, Jesus starts to interpret the Bible and explain all of this that has happened and how it's God's mercy being revealed to the whole world, but they still know who he is. And then at supper, he breaks bread, tears it apart, and gives it to them, and suddenly they recognize him, and then he vanishes from their sight. And then they go. They go back to Jerusalem, and they tell everybody. Jesus interprets the Bible and then shares a special meal, and this sets the pattern of the church from that day forward in what it became. Luke's saying, if you want to see Jesus, gather with the faithful. Reflect on God's word. Share a meal that Jesus gives you. And through all of that, you will encounter God. So in the Acts of the Apostles, Luke continues for that story, stressing that anyone can be a disciple, men, women, Jews, Gentiles, slaves, free, anyone. In Luke's gospel, it's for those who doubt to know that faith is closely woven with it. And at times when you want a model of what it means to be faithful or to be a follower, when you want a description of Jesus Christ, Luke's Jesus is very human. But where Mark's emphasized Jesus' suffering, Luke's emphasizes Jesus' tremendous compassion and healing and trust in God being modeled for us. Luke shows that to be a disciple of Jesus, you do the things Jesus was doing. Healing, helping, witnessing to God's love and mercy. God's power is revealed whenever and wherever all and any people treat each other with care and compassion as Jesus would. Amen.
The peace of the Lord be with you always. We'll have a sharing of offering at this time. Merciful God, we cry out for the hope and healing you offer. Guide us continually to your service. Make your hands to feed the hungry and prepare us to receive the bread of life. Jesus Christ, our Son, our Savior. Amen.
watch on your beloved ones and keep us from danger. Merciful God, source and ground of all goodness and life, give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless our God. Praise 